I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, to keep everything on time. Uh, so once again, thanks for everybody for uh, joining today's webinar. I'm on honored to host uh, today's seminar titled Democratization of Data. And this seminar is part of a year long seminar series uh, titled Data, Shem seminar, Data Sharing Seminar Series for Societies. My name is Doug Schuster. I am chair of the board on data stewardship at the American Meteorological Society. In this role, I lead the board on data stewardship and efforts to advise and serve the AMS in matters related to data and software stewardship. This includes coordinating activities and services to enhance the use of data in our community and education on community supported data and software stewardship initiatives. Uh, the American Meteorological Society is pleased to be one of 11 societies and federations collaborating on this effort. We are joined by AAA Science, the American Astronomical Society, the American Chemical Society, the American Geophysical Union, the British Ecological Society, the Council on Scientific Society Presidents, the Ecological Society of America, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, and the International U Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So we're pleased to be joined by all these partners in this important topic. And we also thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this effort and really promoting open data and open sharing of data and open science in general. So a little background on uh, why data sharing really matters to the American Meteorological Society. Well, for our community, this has been essential over time really to support our science and to support weather research and forecasting across the globe. Uh, an organization called the uh, World Meteorological Organization as it was formed um, a couple, quite a while back to support data sharing efforts across nations across the globe. And this is really essential to support weather forecasting. If data wasn't openly shared between countries, uh, weather forecasting wouldn't work as it does now and op operational numerical weather prediction was, wouldn't work. So sharing of data openly amongst nations has really been essential to the American Meteorological Society and its constituents and really the globe in general. And this leads into the modern uh, practice of data sharing by researchers. So we've been working really to push this and promote this among our research community of atmospheric scientists and oceanographers. And we really need this to uh, be transparent and build public trust in the research processes in our community. And this includes climate research. And then we also uh, need this to make it much more easy to build upon the work of one another, which is common amongst all scientific research communities. So AMS has invested in this process. We've developed uh, policies on open data and preservation and sharing of software. And we're really interested in this topic and what others are doing. Uh, with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's webinar, Democratization of Data. We have Dr. Sabina Leonelli, who's from the Department of Sociology, Philosophy, and Anthropology at the University of Exeter. Uh, Sabina serves as co-director of the Exeter Center for the Study of Life Sciences, where she leads the data studies research strand theme lead for data governance, algorithms, and values strand of the Exeter Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and Turing Fellow of the Alan Turing Institute in London. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences and Associate Editor, Editor for the Harvard Data Science Review. Sabina is very interested in science policy and has worked with the European Commission as expert for a mutual learning exercise in open science and as a member of the Open Science Policy Platform. Her research spans the fields of history and philosophy of biology, science and technology studies, and general philosophy of science. She carried out her doctoral research in the Netherlands as part of the project Understanding Scientific Understanding uh, based in Amsterdam. So we're pleased to have her as one of our speakers today. Other speaker is Dr. Louise Bez Wiedenhout. Um, she was, she was performed her research at the Institute for Science, Innovation, and Society, University of Oxford. Uh, Luis joined the Institute of Science, Innovation, and Society as a research fellow in February 2017. Uh, she currently works on changing the Changing Ecologies of Knowledge and Action project, 
and her interests are broadly centered on data sharing issues within the life sciences. In particular, she is interested in how the data produced during scientific experimentation enters into circulation and how it is valued by potential downstream users. Her work involves a strong empirical component, including a number of ethnographic studies and laboratories in the UK, USA, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa. Trained in both the life and social sciences, Louise holds a PhD in cardiothoracic thoracic surgery from the University of Cape Town and a PhD in sociology from the University of Exeter. So we're pleased to have uh, Louise. We're pleased to have both of our speakers, Sabina and Louise, with us today. I look forward to their talks and really delighted that they can be here to uh, present in our seminar today. So moving forward, I will ask that you keep yourself on mute during the presentations. And please feel free to type your questions into the chat box or use your virtual hand raise function. Uh, once both of the presentations are complete, we hope to have plenty of time for questions after the presentations. And if you haven't already done so, please include your name and where you are in the chat. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to Sabina. Thank you very much, Doug, for the kind introduction. And thanks to Shelley Stoll and everybody who has been involved in um, a, a preparing this, um, a, this seminar and giving us the opportunity to present here. So uh, what I want to start by uh, talking about uh, in this seminar when it comes to data democratization is questions around uh, data sharing and particularly cultural, institutional and infrastructural dilemmas of data sharing. I'll go fast over a few issues that I hope can then stimulate discussion in the second part of this webinar. So first of all, I think uh, many of us will recognize that there is um, there are various sources of trouble in science at the moment that uh, we are trying to um, handle. Um, one is the fact that we have a very unequal uh, and, and, and equitable um, research landscape where people have access to different types of resources, different funds of fundings. Um, they're also subject to diverse and sometimes problematic incentive systems where they have to uh, research is assessed in very, very different ways. Um, there is, to some extent, some control by or anyhow dependence on companies and infrastructures that can also be inscrutable. And I think particularly in the realm of data, uh, this is very often the case, given the monopoly of some of the big uh, cloud services, for instance, hold on some parts of research. Um, there are various forms of discrimination at work that we're all trying to fight in our own institutional setups. Uh, there is, to some extent, a lack of accountability and public trust, at least in some domains of research, which have seen uh, arise and become more strident uh, over the last few years, also due to the political climate. And there is um, a continuing problem with a short-term understanding of the scientific, political, and economic benefits of research that haunts the ways in which research is planned for, designed, and carried out. Now, uh, moving into open and open science has been widely hailed as a solution to some of this trouble. This is uh, one of the ways in which uh, open science is defined. I'm taking this definition from uh, a European Commission um, report issued in 2015 that was very important in laying the ground for some of the policy work happening now on open science. And here, open science is defined as a new approach. I would, of course, as somebody who works in philosophy and history of science, take issue with this idea. I think uh, open has been a feature of uh, research and particularly data sharing in many fields for many years. But nevertheless, a new approach to the scientific process based on cooperative work and new ways of diffusing knowledge by using digital technologies and new collaborative tools. It also means sharing and using all available knowledge at an earlier stage in the research process. So you can see already from this definition that we are looking at uh, um, various different elements uh, as part of the open science landscape. There is a, an appeal to values and to norms in research. There's an appeal to the effective use of technologies that we have at our disposal today. And there is an appeal to a particular construal of the different stages through which we go through as researchers and at which stage is actually best to share materials, share data and um, share components of research. Now, in all of this, open data continues to be a crucial component and a central challenge for the implementation of open science. 
This is because data has a relatively new prominence as a research output. I think it's only in the last two decades that we really come to appreciate uh, how data can be valuable in their own right, um, even disjoint from particular uses of data as evidence. And this is particularly important in relation to how mobile our data are. So um, for data to be valuable, for it to actually contribute, say, to big data analysis, data needs to be mobilized. It needs to be available to various different audiences and typically to more audiences than just uh, the people who have originally produced the data. This also means, because we are revaluating um, what, uh, you know, the value we attribute to data, that the relationship between data publication and article publication, and also the credit associated to these activities is being redefined. And yet there are continuous issues with how we assess the quality of data and how we think about the responsible dissemination of data. Now, if we do achieve a responsible um, cluster of practices around data management, we certainly could foster a, a you know, post or you know, in the midst of COVID global transformation of research and its role in decision making. We could push for more equitable participation in the creation of knowledge through data stewardship that is increasingly transparent, that is subject to scrutiny by colleagues and uh, interested members of the public from different parts of the world, and is grounded on a commitment to justice and fairness. And in fact, responsible data management could help to rethink um, the very way in which we run science, the way in which we run science policy, science funding, and how we practice uh, research and we evaluate the products of research. So the big question is under which conditions can these kinds of promises actually work? Now consider uh, just for a moment what has been happening in the pandemic. Uh, in many ways, many people have hailed uh, the research work that has happened under the shadow of the disastrous pandemic we are still experiencing as an unassailable demonstration of the value of open science, in particular of open data. So there are many arguments and many examples of how discovery has really been accelerated by a rapid dissemination of results and sharing of results. And this is evident through uh, the uh, open access um, release, or at least temporarily, of all the papers that were relating uh, to COVID by many of the major publishing companies. And also, of course, uh, the fact that uh, many of the existing data infrastructures that were able to uh, disseminate data actually were vindicated in many ways, and they were um, very much useful and used uh, to be able to uh, inform the pandemic response. We have very many examples of these kinds of um, open science platforms and open data platforms being very useful. I think in the USA, for instance, the, the repurpose of some of these platforms that were devoted to influenza uh, to then embrace data sharing uh, also uh, among scientists and with uh, relevant members of the public, for instance, patient groups um, around COVID has been really, really important. Um, associations like the Research Data Alliance, who's been um, building up over the last few years, a wonderful repository of um, collaborative connections and venues to work on data sharing has also been extremely efficient. Already by June 2020, they've published uh, recommendations for how to share data during the pandemic, and so on and so forth. We have many examples also in Europe and the UK that I'm happy to revisit if you want to come back to this. At the same time, uh, one of the things I've been trying to evidence in my um, work has been that, in fact, this has, hasn't really been an overarching story of success only. Um, the pandemic has also um, allowed us to highlight even more existing and continuing technical issues with sharing data, as well as models and software and, and other research components, a persisting lack of clarity over the rights and the obligations that pertain to sharing data, both for people who are producing the data, for people who are subjects of the data, and for people who are then reusing the data and the results coming out of data analysis. Um, there is uh, still a lack of consultation and collaboration with uh, relevant communities and disciplines in many parts of uh, data science and data infrastructure. There has been, to some extent, an exploitation of data which have been accumulated on and through patients from around the world. It's not quite clear what the returns for that are. And there's been continuing polemics on how to govern a data sharing and data access, particularly at the transnational level, particularly given the constant political tensions we see now emerging between uh, different scientific superpowers. 
Uh, we have evidenced some of these issues in a report that we have issued through the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, part of that report, which I was uh, co-leading on, uh, was devoted to data readiness issues. And indeed, uh, we showed that while there's been wonderful examples in the UK of a very, very effective data sharing, uh, there's also been an evidencing of the fact that the country really, like the data infrastructures, really wasn't prepared for the kind of emergency and urgency that the pandemic presented. And particularly, there's been a lot of um, unusable medical data, um, even the ones that were already stored data infrastructures were, were not that many, due to the lack of metadata, which were appropriate, and and also appropriate domain expertise. And in fact, at least for the UK pandemic response, being able to receive data from other countries, for instance, from Northern Italy, really proved essential. I think another interesting case, briefly I want to consider, is the case of the GSAID platform, which was set up to allow, to, in, to, in 2008, to share influenza genomic data securely and responsibly. One of the great advantages of the platform was that it would actually request people that were sharing their data also to abide to a, a particular agreement of governance, so that people who would then reuse the data would need to actually acknowledge people who originally contributed the data and uh, would need to also notify people who originally contributed the data of the fact that this data was now being reused. And this was a very important platform because it really fostered trust and exchange over SARS-CoV-2 data among researchers based in different parts of the world, including parts of the world that typically are reluctant um, to contribute data to an international effort for fear of being scooped or being taken over and uh, overseen. And um, uh, so this was a very interesting um, a platform put forward, and yet it was actually um, very much attacked on the international arena for not being open enough, precisely because this wasn't really straightforward open data. It was data that was actually securely held in a silo, and one had to go through a rather uh, you know, simple but still existing procedure to be able to access the data. And this was actually regarded by quite a lot of researchers in the genomic arena as something that really was creating problems and was stopping uh, scientific progress. And I think this raises all sorts of interesting questions around how we think about the challenge of open data. Uh, because I think we need to really remind ourselves that open data uh, done in a way which is indiscriminate and not taking account of the realistic uh, conditions uh, the world is in at the moment, including many researchers, actually risks to have the opposite effect of fixing science, actually risks to exasperate some of the existing problems. Uh, we already are looking in the big data domain at very often the unregulated um, mass surveillance of human behavior at individual and community levels done through uh, data production and data analysis. And of course, it's very important that open data doesn't contribute uh, to this. It's also important that open data doesn't contribute to expanding existing divides, including digital divides among researchers, and to silence knowledge that comes from low resource research environments and is produced on unfashionable topics. Uh, so it's very important that people who are producing data that could be very relevant to research around the world are not discouraged or um, a, basically put in difficulty in um, sharing their data with others, that there are conditions that guarantee um, trust and guarantee um, a good exchange of data also for all of these uh, contributors. Uh, there are questions, of course, about what it means to privilege reuse of data systematically over actually the production of new data. There are questions emerging in relation to big data methodologies and uh, the importance of uh, paying attention uh, to actually what kind of quality data uh, we put online and generally to try and prevent uh, open data from actually um, just contributing to the marketing of alternative facts, which we have seen happen um, in several occasions in the past. So the key question, I think, we come, when it comes to open data, data sharing, and um, open science more generally, is uh, how do we make sure that uh, these movements contrib contribute to opening new spaces, challenge traditional communication channels and power structures, and encourage participation from below, rather than reinforcing conservatism, bias, exclusion, discrimination, and inequity.
And of course, the proof of the pudding here is an implementation. So we've done a lot of research uh, with my group on the different ways in which data are being disseminated and reused over the years. Partly, this was funded by the European Commission. Uh, we've done research that was also joined with uh, Louise Bezaldenat, which is going to be uh, talking right after me, uh, interviewing researchers around the world and in the UK on what they actually meant by openness and what obstacles they found in implementing that. Uh, we've done research looking at uh, what kind of obstacles there are in sharing data extracted from social media, which is used for public health research, and at the moment doing work uh, looking at agricultural research and what are the implications of sharing data uh, coming from uh, field trials in different parts of the world. And also, as Doug was saying before, uh, doing some work uh, with the European Commission and with various national governments on the implementation of open data um, in different countries and in different systems. So, uh, here is just uh, one slide that summarizes some of the key dilemmas that we found um, underpinning the work of data sharing and data curation. And this, of course, has to do with evaluation and credit systems that people are exposed to, the diversity of research cultures that we find, the cost accountabilities relating to data sharing, the skills and the trainings involved uh, in actually uh, being able to share data and also reuse data that are already available through digital infrastructures existing intellectual property regimes and legal frameworks, the semantic ambiguity relating to the notion of openness um, still today, and of course, all sorts of ethical concerns and concerns with the different kinds of bias, um, including infrastructural bias that we may be putting into the system. Uh, so Lou, Louise uh, was uh, following me, will talk more in detail about infrastructural issues. But of course, what I want to try and end on is the idea that data sharing, I hope I will have given just a few um, hints uh, of, of this, it really requires very hard thinking, particularly to try and make data scrutinizable and reusable, while also remaining mindful of their social and political value and mindful of the fact that data actually are not uh, neutral facts. Um, they really come from very particular social environments and this needs to be taken into account when they're being shared. We had a big discussion on this topic, which was hosted by the Harvard Data Science Review for anybody who is interested in thinking more around this. And I think it's particularly important when thinking about data democratization to think about the reasons why uh, different um, communities of research groups of researchers or individual researchers may in fact mistrust uh, data sharing. What is behind this and how can we actually address this? And of course, one of the uh, ways to try and do this is to push open science and open data to be actually a platform for debate, which is critical, informed and inclusive around how we best set up quality criteria um, and uh, data sharing practices that really bring together different kinds of research, different kinds of communities, uh, which are exposed, which have different resources, which have different interests, and which need to be represented on a global scale. And this is particularly uh, while taking account of the fact that actually implementing open data, as we all know, it requires um, a lot of resources. And this is particularly difficult for places where uh, resources to carry out research are already limited. And so there really is a very big risk here to augment the divide between the um, have all and have nots of the research landscape. And we have a big project that is just started now in Exeter, which is gonna be looking more in detail uh, at these issues. And, um, you know, and um, so I invite you all to um, keep track of that if you're interested in this. Thank you very much for your attention and of course to uh, the founders for my research uh, for their help. Okay, thanks Sabina. Um, now we can go ahead and that was very interesting and I look forward to the question and answer session. Um, but let's go forward and go ahead with Louise and hand the screen over to her. So go, go ahead Louise, thank you. Super, thanks so much, Doug. Um, it's always such a pleasure to follow uh, Sabina uh, in a talk because she gives such a great overview of not only what's happening in the open science landscape, but also the problems that uh, are, are currently in existence. And as Doug said, I'm a, a researcher who looks uh, primarily at issues to do with equity in data access and my particular areas of interest is um, the global south. So I'm going to be talking through uh, some of the some of the issues that have come up in my work in trying to problematize the ideas of uh, infrastructural inequity and uh, discrimination. 
So I included this slide, not because I didn't think Sabrina was going to do a great job on open science, but just to highlight uh, the number of different areas we're talking about when we're talking about open science. We're not just talking about open access and open data. We're talking about free and open source software and um, open educational resources and so forth. And, and I think what this slide really highlights is um, the wide range of areas that are um, currently having huge amounts of activity in it. Um, and these areas of activity are not only changing practices, um, but they're changing the tools and shaping the digital and physical infrastructures that we as researchers are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. And this has really led to what I like to think of as the open science ecosystem. Um, I understand the ecosystem as uh, the, the tools that facilitate online working practices and, and practices of openness um, to underpin open research activities. And, and I really do think that uh, increasingly digital tools are becoming a ubiquitous part of open science, and they facilitate how we understand our access to open resources and collaborative working environments. And in this way, they're really changing the way we do research um, and how research resources, including uh, data sets, publications, educational resources and softwares, are circulated across the globe. And, and this has led to a lot of discussion about what is commonly termed the digital commons. So the idea that the tools will realize the open science ideal um, of communal ownership of informational resources and technology, and thus um, provide a way of um, allowing researchers around the globe to access a non-finite resource that will foster equitable use and value adding um, practices uh, to advance research. So it's um, very easy. Uh, always to get very excited about the promise of open science and, and the idea of a digital commons. And uh, as much as I get very excited when I talk about open science and digital commons, I also get very worried sometimes because um, the discussion tends to almost preemptively assume that we are, we are actually there. And I would like to suggest in this presentation that we're really not anywhere near there. Um, I do feel when unpacking these discussions about open science and digital commons, it's really important to start questioning whether the existing systems, and particularly the digital systems that are creating these environments, um, can actually realize the promises that are um, embedded in <clears throat> the discussions about open science and digital commons. And in particular, we need to interrogate who's building uh, these systems, who's funding the systems, and what values, preferences, and assumptions are being thus built into the systems based on uh, who gets to decide uh, what gets to be included. And from uh, my research, but I think most people will not find this incredibly controversial st statement that um, open science discussions have been spearheaded and uh, largely driven by researchers in the global north. And because of this, we're seeing a very global north attitude to the understanding of open science. And this has a lot of different implications. The first is that low and middle income country scientists are underrepresented uh, in open science discussions, uh, meaning that their concerns and preferences are also underrepresented. Um, similarly, the open science tools and infrastructures are often designed in and for use in the global north, and thus are premised on the availability of external re infrastructures and also research infrastructures. And funding for open science infrastructures ref uh, reflect the preferences and realities of research in the global north. And I think if you if you just think sequentially through those points, you'll see how how we've got to a point where um, we are uh, leading ourselves to, to a situation where we can be building a marginalization into open science infrastructures. So while it's unsurprising that for most, re uh, for most that um, research resources are often scarce in low middle income countries, uh, we don't really unpack how we discuss these resource limitations, both within open science and more generally, um, and, and thinking through this is, is really important. So we need to question how the tools and underlying infrastructures are rapidly developing and whether the design and deployment of these tools adequately address the diverse user communities around the world. And if not, do they perpetuate certain specific visions of how research should be done? And we need to question whether this means that membership to open science communities requires a sort of a fitting in process to specific ways of doing research. And um, perhaps it's useful to think about this um, by uh, unpacking these unconscious biases using two key observations. And the first is that digital tools rely on physical research and social infrastructures. And the second is that digital tools have geographic locations. So the first, um, the first topic I'm gonna address is underlying infrastructures. And I do like these pictures. I took both of them myself. Uh, the first is um, an undergraduate training lab 
in uh, the University of Oxford where I've been working. And the second is a training lab in Zimbabwe where I was uh, teaching and doing some research. And I think you'll see the kind of uh, distinct resource differences that I'm talking about. So, so what does this mean? Um, what I've noticed is that conversations about research tend to, uh, tend to be premised on an assumption about a high income country uh, research environment as normal. And this is hugely problematic for two different reasons. The first is that um, it becomes a benchmark for, for what we understand as a research environment. And in this way, it, it introduces a deficit model um, for articulating contrast between uh, different research environments. So if the high income country research environment is normal, then uh, low income country research environments are somehow uh, deficient and, um, and problematic. Um, the second is a tendency to use binaries when uh, distinguishing low and middle income country research environments from high income country labs. Uh, using binaries such as online or offline, visible or invisible, or funded and unfunded. And um, this puts a lot of pressure on low and middle income country research environments when we're including them in conversations to catch up. So to assume that in order to conduct research in a specific way, they need to be able to access research resources to be able to make them look and feel like high income country uh, research environments. And um, this is not only uh, deeply problematic from a funding perspective, it also flattens the way we can understand supporting a low and middle income country researchers to actually become involved in open science uh, research because it, it, it flattens the um, the options we have for actually addressing their concerns. So uh, just to break it down a little further, um, using a binary such as online and offline, I feel is uh, deeply, uh, deeply problematic because um, you, while researchers may actually be online, they can still have a lot of ICT or information and communication technology challenges that will limit their online abilities. So the use of older software, older hardware can really slow down or, or limit. Uh, the open science uh, resources they're able to engage with. Low bandwidth means that uploading, downloading data can be hugely problematic. Uh, particularly during COVID, working off campus and the cost of data off campus can be uh, a huge uh, challenge for researchers. And for many, uh, particularly early career researchers, sharing computers, uh, sharing ICT infrastructures can mean that they can halve or even, um, even less uh, the, the, the amount of time they can spend online. And that's shape their ability to, um, to engage in uh, digital resources. And this really affects the speed and efficiency with which they can do work. Similarly, the binary of visible and invisible, I think is, is very problematic. And as we emerge into a, a highly online collaborative environment, um, we are seeing an emergence of different ways of, of developing legitimacy as researchers. So uh, creating personal websites, um, using uh, institutional email addresses um, and subscribing to personal networking sites uh, such as uh, academo.edu, ResearchGate, um, creating ORCID ID. And for many researchers, while they will, in low middle income countries, while they will have some of these uh, availability, um, uh, some of these options available to them, they probably won't have access to all of them. Many researchers that I talk about do not have the ability to um, have personal websites or even uh, to have their research showcase on departmental websites, which means that their research activities go largely unrecognized. And um, for many researchers, uh, the problems of their university um, uh, ICT infrastructures mean that the use of their university email addresses is very, very problematic. And therefore they tend to use commercial email addresses such as Gmail or Yahoo, which can undermine their legitimacy um, when engaging with uh, their colleagues online. So all of these issues really problematize the visible, invisible um, binary. And finally, funded or unfunded. Um, a lot of researchers I've spoken to have access to some form of funding, but they tend to be small grants. They're not uh, focused on core funding. Uh, they have high student numbers as a means of uh, getting research done and rapid turnover. And a lot of researchers will tend to mix personal investment um, in their research um, with traditional grants it's just as a way to get their research uh, going forward. So what I think just this whistle-stop tour to these different issues really highlights is that uh, the problems to do with uh, research infrastructures and research resourcing in low middle income countries uh, cannot be seen in a way of binaries, but really as a continuum. And that different researchers will position themselves along these different continuums at different points. So there cannot be one size fits all when it comes to helping uh, low middle income country researchers get online. And really uh, low and middle income country research um, 
infrastructures and uh, environments present a complicated set of challenges that, that really need to only be reflected in, in personal uh, narratives. So I feel if there's one thing I can really try and uh, advocate for is try to avoid per, uh, binary assumptions when talking about low and middle income country uh, research environments. Um, these complex and very heterogeneous research contexts impact where, when, and how open science activities can be accessed by individual researchers in these environments. And because of the heterogeneity, we need a variety of different solutions that address context specific concerns. And because of the way that conversations have been going, funding models and open science strategies and communities often overlook these nuances and therefore overlook key areas for future action. And it's important to recognize that understanding these binaries and where uh, researchers position themselves on the binaries can give better insight into the motivations and concerns of uh, scientists for engaging in open data and open science uh, activities. And thus, a lot of discussion is needed and dialogue is needed between researchers in the global north and low and middle income countries to be able to understand why they're concerned and what can be done uh, to, to, to alleviate these concerns. So I like to advocate the idea of sharing with caring. Um, if uh, researchers are keen to share resources online, please do not think that providing access um, guarantees accessibility. Uh, it's always important to critically think about what tools are being used and whether there are low tech um, as well as high tech solutions that can facilitate access to uh, research resources um, for researchers who might not be able to have access to the infrastructures that would guarantee them the high tech options. And I do think, as I said, dialogue is key. Um, it's also important to recognize that for many low and middle income country researchers, it's, it's quite uncomfortable to raise um, issues to do with their research environments. And um, therefore having open and, and honest dialogue um, is really important and, and needs to be facilitated from both sides. Uh, I do think without knowing the problems, um, we are gonna perpetuate uh, open science ecosystems that actually continue to marginalize people who need the most help. And obviously to avoid the deficit model, I, I think it's incredibly important that we should not build a digital commons that simply expect low and middle income country researchers to catch up and low and middle income country research environments to catch up to what we think of as normal in the global north. So the second area I want to briefly touch on is the idea of physical locations. Um, because open science happens online, it's tempting to think of the open science ecosystem as somehow placeless. Um, but Obviously, that's not true. Um, open science tools, like any digital innovation, have a number of characteristics that anchor themselves, uh, anchor them uh, to physical uh, locations, to national legislations, and to societal norms. And understanding this is really key to understanding um, how biases and marginalizations can be introduced into the open science ecosystem. So, uh, in 2020, I conducted a survey with some friends of mine on. 242 open science tools. And we looked at um, issues to do with uh, place, legislation, um, and so forth. And we come up with a number of very uh, salient um, observations about open science tools that, um, that really should be thought of as quite problematic. The first was to do with host locations. Um, as you'll see from this uh, graph, the vast majority of open science tools were hosted uh, in the US or um, between the UK and the EU. And this, um, re recognizing this uh, geographic inequity, and um, so this incredible uh, concentration of open science uh, host, open science tools being hosted in three different countries, um, can, can lead to us questioning um, how they are actually subject to national legislation, whether their host locations actually cause them to be subject to different types of legislation. The second was looking at the funding of open science tools. So um, we tend to assume that open science tools are community driven and, um, and community funded, but that's not actually the case. Um, the vast majority of them have uh, got mixed funding, which means mixed commercial and uh, grant funding. And then uh, quite a few other uh, of them just have uh, pure commercial funding. And recognizing this means that open science tools are subject to national financial legislation because they're located in different countries. And if, they're so, if they are receiving commercial funding, it can uh, impact on, um, uh, on the legislation that is governing them. And the third uh, observation that we had was that there are a number of, a uh, very small number of um, open science tools 
that play an inordinately key role in uh, the open science ecosystem, particularly GitHub, is not only highly used, um, it also underpins uh, the working of a, a vast array of other open science tools. So they rely on GitHub to store the code, to store um, their, even their terms and conditions and so forth. So you get these, these very prominent um, node tools within the open science ecosystem that control access to a whole number of other um, digital open science tools. And this can mean that the availability of key open science tools influences pathways of use within the open science ecosystem. So what does this mean for open science tools? Um, I included this slide because I think it's a really great um, example. Um, I think for many of us, it would, for many of you, it would be surprising that um, GitHub, while an open science tool is not, um, not equally accessible to researchers around the globe because GitHub is a commercial um, enterprise and it is located in the US, it's subject to US financial legislation, which means that it cannot transact with countries that the US currently holds sanctions against, which means that GitHub is blocked in Iran and, and other countries. And um, this uh, is a great example because it, it shows the massive disruptions um, in engagement, not only to the access of resources and collaborative projects, but also um, to the range of other open science tools that use GitHub in the design that, that uh, researchers in the Iran are currently struggling with. And it really highlights the fact that while the digital um, open science ecosystem seems to be this place, this place where everyone can access unlimited resources, um, there are checks and balances and uh, sluice gates and bottlenecks uh, that really shape who can access what and, and how they can work their way through uh, the different um, aspects of the environment. And I think these observations really uh, highlight the need to critically unpack the open science landscape. Um, what I hope the three slides have showed is that uh, governments and commercial companies have undue influence on the landscape due to their hosting, financing, and otherwise influential roles. And because of this, we cannot simply assume that the resultant open science ecosystem will automatically reflect and perpetuate the core values of open science, and that there are a different range of a uh, range of different factors inherent within open science tool design that create a landscape that continues to perpetualize marginalization and exclusion of certain researchers around the world. And this really undermines the idea of the digital commons in my perspective, um, as, an, as a way of providing unlimited access to shared resources. So I think there's a huge amount of room for change. I think because the open science landscape is evolving and malleable, there are huge opportunities to create structures that support just and equitable research futures, but we need to start being more critical about um, what we include in the open science ecosystem and what we question. We need to be very aware of current inequalities and in access that are very important in shaping uh, the futures that we're going to have um, from open science. So just as a couple of final comments and perhaps a, a call to arms, um, I think open science can be think, thought of in many ways. Openness is an ideal, it's a set of practices, but it's also a responsibility. And it's a responsibility of all researchers to critically interrogate open science tools and infrastructures and, and the way they are used and the way they're shaping modern research. And researchers need to be highly aware of the issues to do with equitable access. And um, so as to be able to make informed decisions about the tools that they use and the, way, the places that they share and the practices that they endorse. Um, it's very important to ask difficult questions about tool and infrastructure design, about regulation and about deployment to ensure that we shape an open science future that is inclusive and equitable. And asking questions, continuing asking questions um, about research environments is key uh, to getting the ball rolling on these different issues. So uh, just in conclusion, I'd like not only to thank Sabina for the work I've done with her, but also uh, two people who've helped me uh, do the work on the digital open science ecosystem, which is uh, Joe Haverman and Hugh Shanahan. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you very much, Louise. Uh, those are both fascinating talks, uh, getting me thinking for sure about the different inequities out there. We've dealt with that some in terms of a project I'm on and sharing simulation output data and expectations for that. And uh, some of the challenges, you know, not necessarily thinking about lower middle income countries, but just dealing with uh, institutions that aren't as large or well-funded and, and what should the expectations be for researchers from those institutions versus larger institutions. So I think there's, there's different scales and scopes of these issues going on where I'd say large, well-funded institutions drive a lot of these expectations for open science that sometimes underfunded institutions 
you know, can't meet necessarily due to some of the, some of the uh, issues that you've just described. So thanks for highlighting that. So I'll just, I'll go to the audience questions that we have now. And if you have any questions for either speaker, for both speakers, please ch type them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. And um, if you need to clarify something that's been written in the chat as a question, please feel free to speak up as well. So we have a question from Clarissa Russell. Are there, are there cultural issues that need to be addressed if there is debate regarding reviewing data? So um, do you have anything to add to that, Clarissa, for that question? Feel free to speak up and if, if, you, if you wanna go ahead and answer as well, either one of the speakers, feel free to go ahead. I don't know if Clarissa wants to add anything to her question. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I mean, I can just uh, provide a thought. Uh, I think part yeah. of um, Louise's presentation has already answered some of this. I mean, when she was talking, for instance, about the role that different um, availability of technologies plays in data accessibility. Uh, I think another side of that matter that hasn't come up maybe quite as yet is um, cultural issues to do with expectations around how uh, the availability and access to certain technologies may play a role in how good or how bad your data are. Uh, so I think that's also a very important set of assumptions, uh, which um, in some communities are very important. Uh, so I know that for a lot of work going on in biology, um, having a, a access to, say, the latest um, genome sequencer is seen to be, uh, at least by some, a mark for having access to good data, right? And, and almost a guarantee that the data that are being shared are going to be of higher quality than data produced with uh, more antiquated technology, if you, if you know, we can consider technology from 10 years ago to be uh, completely uh, old fashioned. Um, but of course, um, this is not such a straightforward matter. It also very much depends on the goals of the research, the type of uh, genetic markers that people are looking at. So it really shouldn't be, there shouldn't be straightforward associations with, uh, between having access to the latest technology for data production and providing data which is of a certain quality, right? That may be valid in some respects, but not in others. So that's just, I think, another example of a cultural assumption that can be very damaging uh, when applied to data sharing. And I don't know, I mean, I'm sure uh, Louise has many other examples in mind. Oh, I totally agree. I think um, there, there are these, uh, I, I think in my opinion, it has to do with a, a misunderstanding of the idea of innovation, that innovation can mean two different things. It can be new or better. And uh, we tend to always assume of innovation and innovative research as new, as in using the newest technologies and so forth, and not actually refining or providing really reasoned uh, research using older technologies. And I think understanding that bias in the way people understand uh, quality data is really important. Hey, thank you. Um... I had a question that came up uh, during Sabina's talk, and it has to do with the culture of, you know, rewarding open science and incentivizing open science. So that's a challenge uh, within our discipline, in the atmospheric sciences for sure, I think, and in other disciplines. Typically, researchers have been rewarded in many cases for not sharing data and software and publishing lots of articles and writing grants based on some of those products. Um, do you have examples of uh, success where um, some of these incentives have been implemented to support open science in terms of rewarding researchers with um, merit increases, those types of things? So really, how do we change that culture? Yes. So, I mean, so far, I think in the studies I've made, the, the two kinds of cases I found where this is most frequently the case are either in communities of researchers that even if they're spread around the globe are still relatively small in the sense that people tend to know each other, at least they tend to know um, 
the different research groups that are involved. There's a little bit more, if you want, personal accountability and therefore a little bit more trust network being built. So in those situations, for instance, we see this in some of the model organism communities uh, where there's a lot of work in exchanging data on particular model organisms. I mean, for instance, for yeast, uh, I've seen that very clearly, a community which is very tight knit, even if it's a bit spread out, it's not that everybody knows each other very well, but there is still a sense of accountability to each other and really making sure that whenever reusing data that one finds on the community database, there would be a sense of attribution of credit and, um, and even just having exchanges with people that actually created the data in the first place. Uh, so that's one case. The other case is situations where you actually have a data governance system. And this can take many forms. It can be a data silo of some sort. It can be an institution that really acts as a mediator between data producers and data users and guarantees that uh, the exchanges that are taking place are equitable and that due credit um, is given. Uh, also, very often, these kinds of institutions play an important role in putting data users back in touch with data producers, again, uh, when there is potential questions of credit arising, when there is clarity notifications needed on, on the data that are being put out when the, the data are not sufficient. And so I've been working, for instance, with the sale um, a, a, a database, which is a, a secure infrastructure set up in Wales to try and uh, anonymize and secure access to uh, biomedical data here in the UK. And that has actually been a very important institution also in having this kind of mediating role in making sure that uh, producers and users of data actually had sort of a mediated exchange, particularly because these are communities with, where people don't know each other because it's too large, the, the potential field of users. Okay, thank you. It's an important topic. So we have a few more audience questions uh, from Jake Yeston. I wonder if Louise could comment on the problematic dominance of English as the lingua franca of not only the scholarly literature, but also the software archive and what we can do to improve that situation in the near term if services like Google Translate aren't adequate in technical context. I think it's a great question um, and definitely one that I don't have uh, any particular answer to. I think it is important to recognize the dominance of English and uh, English being a kind of entry bar to, um, to research and, and scholarly publications. Um, I think what we're seeing, particularly in West Africa, is, is quite interesting that uh, while there is still an expectation that you'd publish in English, there is an interest in uh, also translating the paper the author translating the paper into French and releasing it uh, online so that uh, scholars who perhaps aren't as fluent in English could um, take advantage of that. Um, and there's also within Africa Archive uh, an attempt to translate um, abstracts into different languages so that there is at least some sort of um, accessibility of these research resources um, for, for researchers who are not perhaps as fluent in English. So I think there are ways that we can think around it. Um, I definitely agree with Jake. I think using Google Translate to, to run a whole lot of papers through is not actually going to do anything apart from confuse the field. But I think by taking targeted uh, innovations like that, uh, um, targeted actions like that, we could actually start thinking through uh, issues to do with linguistic accessibility much more seriously. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Lisa Anderson. Do you have any advice for individual investigators regarding what vehicles of dissemination are best? I sometimes find it difficult to balance ease of use with harnessing the best repository for data with ensuring equitable dissemination to the greatest extent possible. Thanks. So I guess, unfortunately, that trade-off will always be there. We're all very familiar with it in our own research and in others. Um, and it will certainly be the case, I would say, without exception, that uh, a more responsible uh, data dissemination practice will probably be more time consuming. You will need to spend at least at the beginning more time familiarizing yourself with um, what the best practices are. Uh, you need to spend a little bit more time thinking about what the potential implications of data sharing may be, potentially engage 
uh, various partners in, in helping you to make that assessment. And of course, there is expertise also in, in thinking about what responsible data management may be. I mean, in my experience, that's actually not time wasted. Um, it's time that actually comes back in other form at the other side um, you know, of the game where one actually it wants to ensure a data reuse, which is more equitable and it wants also to ensure to be able to reuse this data under the best conditions. So, I mean, it's not time wasted, but of course it's, um, we are living in a system where we need to produce results very quickly. And it's perfectly understood that it's difficult for researchers at the moment to take more time at the moment of data curation, even the design of research uh, to think about these issues. But I think unless this happens, particularly maybe among the more senior uh, researchers, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to change the system. And if I can just add a little bit more to that, um, I think in, in terms of thinking about equity of, of dissemination, it's important to recognize that it's not just, you don't, you, you don't have to only deposit your data in one particular place, you know, that you can, you can use more than one, one which is um, particularly relevant to your discipline and um, and you're very familiar with, and then maybe one more generic one like Zenodo, but by using different types of places to put your data, you can ensure that the greatest number of people can have access to it. And maybe one is a lower tech solution that you know isn't particularly disciplinary specific or, or highly uh, valued in your, in your research community, but can actually improve um, equity of access. And it's all about linking uh, the sites in which your data is uh, are being deposited together so you know keeping all those links on your website so that if people cannot access a specific one or, or something like that, that they can still go and and try and find the data somewhere else right thank you now we have a question from patricia morris what guardrails and guideposts should be envisioned to protect the rigor and reproducibility of the data to be shared and reused how do we how do the collective we protect everyone from developed and low and middle income countries from adverse effect of effects of garbage in, garbage out? So I think actually answering this question, which is of course really important at the moment, um, continues what uh, Louise was saying just now. Um, so I really don't think we can provide any universalized uh, guideline for what constitutes garbage data. Uh, it's been tried in many ways, there's been many studies looking, as many of you are aware, uh, at issues of uh, how does one referee for data quality, but precisely because the, of the diversity of repurposing that can be associated to the same data set is actually very hard to do because uh, for one community, uh, what, what what community regards as noise or garbage may well be um, very important signals for another community. Uh, so I think this may be where we need to accept that all purpose uh, databases and data infrastructures are in fact very problematic. Uh, sure, they're one first step into making data available, but uh, probably we need to start thinking about the fact that any data infrastructure may need to make quite clear what is its scope and also what are its limits. You know, what are the things, what are the kind of research goals that it can cater for and what are the kind of research goals that it really you know, cannot really make pronouncements on? Because that at least gives you some um, criteria to then approach the review of the data and to really think, okay, well, this data set may perhaps be useful to people working in this particular field, but that's not really what we are doing here. Here we're interested in something different and therefore uh, these are cr the criteria that we are using to determine which data are most reliable. And at the risk of sounding a little um, boring, um, I do think the guide rails um, that are needed to, to stop the garbage and garbage out are a better research data management training for researchers, a better investment in data stewards and better investment in data curators. And um, if we stop, if, if all of us are more aware of the type of data we're putting in, um, maybe we can start streamlining the process a little bit more. That's a good insight. Uh, we have another question from Steve Diggs and we might have to close it out about right here as we're nearing the top of the hour. Is there a coming storm with confluence of older IT infrastructure at institutions in low and middle income countries, more online research and an increased security attack surface and visibility? For instance, my R1 institution is devoting more and more resources to cybersecurity, obsessing about old hardware, current patches and leading practices. And yeah, I echo that, Steve. 
Well, I, I think it is not even coming the storm. I think we're right in the middle of it, um, unfortunately. And um, the thing that worries me is not only, I mean, it's very obvious also from your own question, um, you know, there is, of course, um, huge potential and actuality of a huge gap between institutions that actually can uh, take care of some of these aspects and others that, uh, that do not or uh, don't have the resources to do that. But I think even more worrying for me is the fact that even at this point in time, concerns around data security tend to still be separate from concerns around responsible data management, around uh, good data curation, and even just the digitalization of, of data access. And I think that is a really big problem in many institutions, uh, even my own. Um, these two discourses seem to be owned by different groups, uh, different parts of the institution. And instead, I think they really need to be brought together. So thinking about data security properly actually means also thinking about uh, intelligent ways of curating data, which may also actually rely and, and contribute even financially more to international efforts to share data and to construct data silos rather than keep trying to have everything in-house in an institution. But this is the kind of mentality and approach that of course is very, very difficult to propose, particularly actually to some institutions in the Global North. And just to add one more thing, uh, just because I know we're running out of time, that, uh, well, I agree with Steve's comment. I do think in a way, it's not necessarily, as Sabina says, just a problem for low middle income countries, but, but for everyone. And, and in a way, some institutions in low middle income countries are in a better situation because they have so little ICT infrastructure and the investments are just coming in that they actually might be able to benefit from the experiences of uh, research institutions in the global north and actually start becoming you know, the, the first institutions that actually have these, um, these systems put into place. So maybe it's a, an exciting time as well. Hey, great. Well, thanks everybody for participating today and for the interesting talks and discussion. I think we could keep going for a while, but we've run out of time. So um, at this point, I'd like to highlight a couple of upcoming seminars that are, are coming as part of this series. Uh, the next one will occur on uh, the 5th of November. And the title is The Data You Document Are the Data We Love. And I think the topic is about metadata and some of the details associated with metadata and uh, just really the importance of that and facilitating the sharing and discovery of data. So that one will be at 10 a.m. Eastern and uh, 1400 UTC. And I was supposed to note that the US is still on uh, daylight savings time and other partners ne aren't necessarily on daylight savings time. So please adjust your schedule accordingly. And then we also have a, a great seminar coming up on the 3rd of December titled Reproducibility and Open Scholarship, National Academy's Efforts and Roles for Societies. And we're pleased to have Dr. Marsha McNutt, who's the president of the National Academy of Sciences in the US uh, to lead this seminar. And uh, that one will be at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 1600. So at that point, we'll all be on the same time schedule or no. Yeah, we will be. It should, it should say Eastern Standard Time, I think. So anyway, all those details will be provided. Thanks again, everybody, for joining today and uh, have a good weekend.